You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website, newlifewayland.org. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to New Life Church. My name is Brad, and I serve as one of the pastors here. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, I'd love love to meet you at some point today. And I just want to say, even before we begin, um, I'm just so grateful for our staff here. Uh, For Josh and for Trent, for Kathy, for Aaron, for Cindy and Cheryl. Can we just say thank you to them? Yeah, even just being able to hear stories of, you know, Josh taking students to Fusion down in Indiana. Um, I heard another story from a family where it was actually their kids that said, hey, can we read the Bible together as a family because of what kids are learning in our kids' ministry right now? And so it's just really cool to see God moving through our staff and through our volunteers uh, right now at New Life. If you have your Bible with you, will you grab it and turn with me to Psalm chapter 23? Psalm 23, if you're new to the Bible, you just turn right to the middle and uh, you'll get pretty close. Psalm 23, we've been working through a series called The Lies I Tell Myself, where we're looking at this chapter verse by verse and allowing Jesus to speak truth into our lives that combats these lies. So verse 3, let's look at this together. He, the good shepherd, restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Man, there is power in this verse here this morning, and I cannot wait to unpack it together. Will you pray with me as we begin? Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have just to worship you, to declare with our mouths, with our hearts, with our lives that you are worthy. And Father, today I pray that as we look into your word, as we study and learn together, God, that your Holy Spirit will be at work. God, I want to just not be in the way of what you want to do. And so, God, I just humble myself before you and just say, God, do what you will in the lives of your people here today. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Midwest winters are no joke. We had a pretty mild one this last year and the last couple years, but if you've been in Michigan any period of time, you know that winters can get pretty intense. And there's few people that winters are more intense for than farmers. In fact, farmers many, many years ago in the Midwest had a big issue when it came to blizzards and to winters. And so what they would have to do is they'd have to go out to their barn and feed their horses or take care of their livestock And blizzards in the Midwest in these pockets would come suddenly and swiftly without warning. And all of a sudden, these farmers would find themselves in white-out conditions. And they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see their hands in front of their own face. They couldn't see their home. They couldn't see the barn. Every tree that marked landmarks and stuff in their yard was invisible. And all of a sudden, these farmers would find themselves completely lost in their own backyards in some cases wandering around in circles, unable to find their way back home. In fact, it got so bad for some that some farmers even froze to death within feet of their own front door, not even knowing how close they were to safety because of how blinding this blizzard was. And so this became a real problem for for certain pockets of Midwest farmers, and so they came up with an ingenious solution to this problem. What they began to do is they would grab a rope and they would tie one end of the rope to their house and then the other one, this is much shorter than probably what they used, would be tied to their barn or wherever they needed to go. And what they would do in the blizzard when they couldn't see two feet in front of them is they would use the rope to guide them from the house to the barn and back to safety again. You see, in the midst of these horrible blizzard conditions, the farmers had a choice. 
Will they allow the blizzard to lead them? Or will they allow the rope to lead them? Now the reality is, every single one of us are being led by something. Some of us like to believe that we're pretty autonomous or we're our own person or we make up our own mind, but that's actually, that's actually not true. Every single one of us is being led by someone or something. And, and the question today is, am I being led by the blizzard? Or am I being led by the rope? See, we live in an age that would like you to believe that you are more autonomous than you think you are. But really, there are no free thinkers in the world. Every single one of us is being formed by someone or something. If you disagree with what I'm saying, think about this last Monday. They convinced us all to look right at the sun for hours at a time. The world has no free thinkers. We're all being shaped by something. Whether it's politicians that are shaping us, media, corporations, celebrities, influencers, we are all being shaped by something. Man, I sound like a conspiracy theorist here this morning. I belong to the Flat Earth Club. We have members all around the world. (laughs) Some of you will get that in a minute. Here's the point. Uh, You have a choice. Will you let the blizzard of this age lead you, or will you let the rope lead you? And here's, here's what I want to say as we begin. The blizzard simply isn't working. The blizzard of this age simply isn't working. You see, if, if having more information were the solution to mature us, then we should be the most mature generation to ever walk the face of the planet. We live in the age of information And yet, I don't think a single person listening here this morning would say that we are growing as a society in maturity. Or or what about this one? If, If affirmation and acceptance of identity is the key to true stability and security, then then we should see a plummet in the suicide rates and mental health crises of young people, especially in the LGBT community. And yet, just the opposite is happening. Suicide rates and mental health crises are skyrocketing. The blizzard of this age is not working. You see, it sounds really nice to say, I'm going to do me, I'm going to live my truth until you can't see your own hand in front of your face because you're in such crisis. It sounds nice to say Jesus loves me just the way I am and doesn't want to change me, that has a nice ring to it until I find myself freezing in my own fragility right outside my front door. There has got to be something better that we are offered. And the question that I want to invite you to wrestle with this morning and the question that I actually really believe this psalm is getting at here is this. If you found yourself in a blizzard and there was a rope that promised to lead you home, Would you grab it and let it lead you? You know, stats tell us that most of our lives are actually saying no to that question. There's a a research group named Barna that does a lot of church-wide and and religious research in the United States, and one of the things they found recently is that 63% of Americans identify as Christian, And that number is going lower, but 63% identify as Christian, and yet only about 4% of Americans are actively obeying Jesus and being led by him in trust and growth and maturity. That is a staggeringly low number, that only only 4% of Americans are being led by the rope. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to wrestle with this question in Psalm 23.3. Psalm 23.3, and I want to look at this line by line. Again, there's only two lines like there were last week. Uh, But the first line is this, and this is exactly what David, the writer of this psalm, wants us to wrestle with. He says this, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. Now, if you're anything like me, and maybe you've read this verse many, many times throughout your life, when when you initially read this verse, he restores my soul, or maybe your translation says something like, he refreshes my soul, you often think to yourself, oh, I got tired, I got burned out, and I rest, and I experienced restoration as a result of my rest. 
That is not an untrue statement. We talked about that last week. Green pastures, still waters. But I don't believe that's actually what verse 3 is saying. I don't believe that that's what David wants us to understand when he talks about how this good shepherd restores my soul. I actually believe there's something deeper that he's after in this. And so when you look at shepherding stories throughout the Bible, and there's a lot of them, they follow a similar theme to each other. And in nearly every single shepherding story, there's a moment where a sheep gets lost. In fact, sheep have this nasty tendency to wander off and get lost. And what you see in these shepherding stories is the shepherd who goes out and gets the sheep and returns the sheep back to the fold or back to the flock. And that word for return is the Hebrew verb shuv. Can everybody say shuv? Shuv. You got to say it with some passion. Shuv. Now, this verb means to return or to repent. It's repentance style language. I'll give you one guess what verb is used in verse 3 of Psalm 23 here. It's this it's repentance language, it's return language. It's following the same pattern of other shepherding stories throughout the Old Testament and throughout the scriptures. In other words, what I believe David is saying here is that we as sheep have a tendency to wander off. We have a tendency to, if you will, let go of the rope, to wander out into the blizzard, to find ourselves directionless, lost, unable to see our own hand in front of our face. And if you know things about sheep, I love making fun of sheep because they're so stupid They're so dumb. But sheep, when they get lost, when they wander away from the flock or away from the path, they find themselves in a really vulnerable and a really dangerous spot where their lives are at risk. Actually, uh, I heard this story this last week, and this just might be my favorite sheep story of all time. Not that I have that many favorite sheep stories, but (laughs) this has got to be up there. So in 2005, uh, on a Turkish countryside, there was a sheep that randomly wandered off the side of a cliff and fell to his own demise. This is dark humor, by the way. So he fell to his own demise, which is not that big of a deal until you hear that after this first sheep fell, 1,499 of his friends followed suit and walked right off the side of the cliff right behind him. 1,500 sheep fell off this cliff. I actually brought a picture to kind of show you what this looked like. It's a reenactment, not action. I'm not going to show you a picture of bloody sheep in a ravine. Are you kidding? I think you could find some. I imagine like a a dad sheep saying to his son in this moment, like, son, if all your friends walked off the side of a bridge, would you follow them? And then the dad's like, yes, son, yes, you would. You should do just that. Follow them right off the bridge. There is a happy ending to this story, though, because only 450 of the sheep that walked off the cliff died. The rest just bounced off the fluffy bodies of their friends and kept on walking. (laughs) It's a true story. You could read about it. Here's the point. Sheep know what it's like to let go of the rope, to wander off, to wander aimlessly without direction. We, We have so kind of, you know, internalized this as a society that we've come to use the term sheep as an insult to describe people who just follow people off the side of the cliff or who wander aimlessly without direction, people lost in the blizzard. This is the term that we've come to use as an insult. And I hate to tell you this, but like the Bible kind of says that's all of us. Like we're all sheep. Every single one of us. Jeremiah 50 verse 6 says this. It says, my people, this is the Lord speaking, we're lost sheep. Their shepherds misled them. The hills led them astray. They forgot their own resting place. In Isaiah 53, 6, the prophet Isaiah says this, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. It does not matter how long you've been following Jesus, or maybe you haven't been following him at all. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. It doesn't matter what your life circumstance look like. Every single one of us knows what it's like from time to time to let go of the rope and to wander off into the blizzard. Every single one of us, myself included. Why do we do this? 
I think in some cases we, we can find comfort in the blizzard. We can find comfort in the blizzard in our own stubbornness, our own arrogance, our own pride. We leave the path. The blizzard is an easy place to hide from our own shame. We don't want to be seen by others. We don't want to be exposed for who we really are, for what we really struggle with. For some of us, we, we wander off the path. We wander away from the rope into the blizzard, and we just plant our feet, and we want to stay there because it is easier to stay in the blizzard than it is to go back to the rope, to be led by Jesus, to have him form us. And so maybe the leader lets us down, the promise of the product falls short, the achievement feels empty, what I'm doing is no longer working, so I sin, I relapse, I cheat, I steal, I manipulate, I abuse. We all know what it's like to wander away from the rope. In fact, Jesus himself had some of his closest friends who wandered away from the rope. One of, one of them that I think of often is Peter. Peter is one of Jesus' closest followers. He's in Jesus' inner circle. He's been with him for years. And on the night that Jesus is going to be arrested, he says to Peter, he says, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny that you ever knew me three times. And what does Peter say to Jesus? He says, no, you're wrong, Jesus. Pro tip, don't ever tell Jesus he's wrong to his face or behind his back. There is no such thing as behind Jesus' back. But anyways, You're wrong, Jesus, and in his own pride, in his own arrogance, what does Peter do the night Jesus is arrested? He denies him three times. He wanders off into the blizzard of his own arrogance. He lets go of the rope. And in the morning, at the moment where he hears the rooster crow, Peter is utterly undone by his sin. What have I done? I've wandered. And he sees it. And he's exposed, and he's in the moment of one of his greatest failures of his life. He finds himself in the blizzard. I've let go of the rope and wandered into the blizzard many times in my own life. Chances are you have too. Maybe you're there right now. You're in the middle of the affair. You're in the middle of the relapse. You convinced yourself they are the problem You had to step away from ministry because your marriage was on the rocks. I know what it's like to be in the blizzard. Chances are you do too. And yet, the promise of Psalm 23 is that there is a good shepherd who restores our souls. See, what the literal passage is saying here, what the literal translation is saying here, is this shepherd restores me to himself. The word soul just means the whole person. So all of me, when I wander off the path, when I let go of the rope, when I find myself in the blizzard, there is a shepherd who restores me to himself. Friends, this is good news. This is good news for wandering souls. When I drift into the blizzard of my own sin and flesh, he restores my whole person to himself. This is the language of repentance. And so what is it that finally gets someone to a point where we say something has to change? The blizzard isn't working. I need a rope. Well, I think we need two things for repentance to genuinely happen in our life. The first thing that we need is an awareness of our own lostness, an awareness of our own sin, a rock bottom moment, if you will, where it's like what I am doing is not working. I am utterly lost I am wandering like sheep without a shepherd. That's number one. But then the second thing we need is we need a clear vision of who God is. We need a clear vision of the beauty and majesty of Jesus that leads us back. To say, I can't change, or this is just the way I am, take it or leave it, or I won't change, or I don't want to change, to make any of those statements over our life is to deny the very process that Jesus himself says he wants to take each and every person in this room through. His greatest desire for you and for me is to have his character formed deeply in us. And so what is your posture towards the sin in your life? What is your posture towards the destructive tendencies in your own heart and your own soul? 
Is it acceptance, just the way I am? Is it indifference? I don't care to change. I don't care to come back. Is it defensiveness? Don't you dare name this in me. Is it shame? What is the posture towards the destructive tendencies in your own life? And then the flip side here, what could be possible in your life if you let Jesus restore your soul? What could be possible for your family, for your workplace, for your own sense of self if you invited Jesus to restore your soul? We see this process play itself out in the second part of Psalm 23.3 here. Check out what David says in the second line here. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, the shepherd who restores my soul puts my hand on the rope of repentance that leads me home, that leads me to safety, that leads me in obedience to himself. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, when David is talking about this path of righteousness, he's talking about the path of restored relationship with the Father. He's not simply talking about, hey, I grab onto the rope and I behave better or I perform better for the world or I'm accepted because I perform well. Or He's not talking about legalism. He's talking about a restoration of right relationship with God, with the Father. For whose namesake? His namesake. In other words, on this path, When we repent, we bear his name. We walk in right relationship with him. It is the most freeing place that you could be. See, one of my my pet peeves with Christians, am I allowed to talk about my pet peeves with Christians? Okay, (laughs) don't get too excited, okay? Uh, Is when all we do is we rail against the culture or we rail against sin and we don't actually give people a glimpse of the beauty of Jesus. And that's exactly what David is getting at here in this psalm. That not only are we called away from our sin, but we are called to the goodness of the good shepherd for his namesake. There's a leadership expert named John Maxwell who said once, it it really takes two things for somebody to change. The first thing is we have to hurt enough we need to. And the second thing is we need to be inspired enough we want to. In other words, it's not enough just to have a disdain for sin. It's not enough just to walk away from sin. We actually need a vision of what and who we're walking towards. We need a vision of the beauty and the majesty and the glory and the righteousness and the holiness and goodness of Jesus. There is a push and a pull in repentance. We need something more than just a disdain for the blizzard. We need to see the beauty of Jesus. We are restored and walk in righteousness for his name's sake. And when we get a glimpse of Christ's beauty, sin becomes incredibly ugly to us. See, friends, true repentance is both leaving behind the ugliness of sin, but it's walking towards the beauty of Jesus. There's a Scottish minister named Robert Murray McChain, which is just an amazing name. Uh, And he said this. He said, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely. Such infinite majesty and such meekness and grace. And all for sinners, even the chief. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart, and so there will be no room for folly or the world or Satan or the flesh. Take 10 looks at Christ for every look you take at yourself. See, this is how Jesus restores his friend Peter. In Peter's moment of greatest shame, greatest hiding, as he's wandered out into the blizzard, what does Jesus do? A few days later, he sits with them on a beach as breakfast is cooking, and he begins to just restore Peter's soul. He says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes. He says, then feed my lambs. Once again, Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, then feed my lambs. A third time, Jesus asks, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Of course, like Peter is so grieved at this point that Jesus would have to ask him three times. 
And what Jesus is doing is he's, he's basically saying, hey, you denied me three times. I'm walking you through a process of restoration. And what's so cool about the way that Peter is restored is what Jesus is doing here is he is pushing and he is pushing and he is pushing on Peter's sin, on Peter's tendency to wander into the blizzard. He is pushing. He wants Peter to be so grieved about the reality of his sin. He wants Peter to be so grieved about his lostness in the blizzard. But he's also doing something else. He's saying to Peter, look at my beauty in the process. Look at what I've done for you. I just died on a cross for you and raised again. Don't just have disdain for your sin, but look at how beautiful I am in the process. See, this is what Jesus does. And then he says to Peter in John 21, verse 19, he says, follow me, Peter. Follow me. Perhaps another way to say this is follow me again. Follow me afresh. Follow me anew. I know this process firsthand in my life. I know this process of restoration well because I'm walking it right now. For those of you who know our story, one of the things I've been doing over the last few weeks is just kind of unpacking piece by piece what God has been doing in our hearts over the last seven months. And so we, my wife and I, had to step away from ministry seven months ago, and part of this process of coming back has been a very clearly laid out restoration process. And uh, we've been meeting every single month with a restoration team, a team of just some incredible godly individuals who are walking alongside us in this process of restoration, who are holding us accountable, who are helping us make sure we are establishing and keeping rhythms of health in our family. And uh, I remember reading this kind of plan that was typed out by the Zero Collective, and this was such a gracious thing for them to offer us. I'm just amazed by the grace and mercy here. But one of the lines in this restoration plan caught my eye early on. And it's something that's held my attention ever since. It's kind of become, for me, a mantra of what restoration really means. And this is what the line says. It says, there is a restoration that only God can make. Men such as David, who wrote Psalm 23, give evidence that God is willing to do so. And then this last line, I think, is what struck me most but it is a costly process. It is a costly process. See, the good shepherd restores all of me to all of himself. His goodness is that he leads me in paths of right relationship with himself and that I can actually wear his name it's for his name's sake, not my own. See, the beauty of Jesus, and this is what I want you to get here this morning, is that he entered into the blizzard and he laid his life down and he gave you a rope. He gave you this gift called repentance. He is so merciful and so kind and so good. And that when we understand this, we don't repent out of shame. And we don't repent out of guilt or regret. We repent because he is beautiful. And he is good. And he is worthy. And there is so much joy in grabbing back onto the rope and repenting. Church, when you see the beauty of Jesus... When you see the lengths that he went out of his love for you, when you grieve what your sin cost him, you run back to the rope and you hold on to it with everything that you have and you let him lead you. See, Peter's sin cost him, but it cost Jesus even more. My sin cost me, but it cost Jesus even more. 
I just want to ask you this question, and I want to leave a few minutes of space here in our service. Kind of revisiting our prayer focus this morning. What sin in my life will I exchange for the beauty of Christ? What sin in my life will I exchange for the beauty of Christ? I just want to invite you to close your eyes and just sit with this question for a moment. One of my daily prayers of repentance in my own life is, Holy Spirit, will you give me fresh revelation of the beauty of Jesus? Holy Spirit, will you give me eyes to see Jesus clearly? Holy Spirit, will you give me such a vision for Jesus in my life? That the only outcome is also a disdain for the sin that is pulling me away from him. the Holy Spirit to bring something to the surface for you right now. An area of wandering. An area of sin. And now picture the cross. Pray silently in your heart, God, will you forgive me of this? God, will you restore my sinful soul? Holy Spirit, will you give me the strength to walk away from this and walk towards Jesus? with a verse from Come Thou Fount, an old hymn, which has been running through my mind all week, and then we're going to respond in worship. It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh, take and seal it with thy spirit from above rescued thus from sin and danger, purchased by the Savior's blood. May I walk on earth a stranger as a child and heir of God. And so Holy Spirit, we thank you for the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, we thank you that you are a good shepherd who restores our souls to yourself. Jesus, we thank you that you lead us on paths of righteousness for your name's sake, that we can walk through this life with confidence, knowing that it is because of what you have accomplished that we have been made right with, your, with the Father. God, I pray for a disdain for sin to just begin growing in our hearts, a disdain for our own sin, for the way sin is wrecking havoc in our own families, in our own lives, God. And may we run towards the rope. May we run towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.